Secretary, which I'm glad to be here too. And for those who don't know Tumblr Ridge, where Charles and Charissa are speaking from, they're very close to this amazing scenery. So let's see if we can make it work. Uh, this is the program. Um, we're going to hear from Sydney Saunders and Christy Demeter from Dawson Creek, uh, then Charissa from Tumblr Ridge, and then me from Chetwind. And then uh, <clears throat> if anyone still is interested, we'll proceed to the didactic part. We turn that around. Over to you, Sydney. Great. Thanks, Dr. Perry. We just wanted to provide some context and some summary of what we've been working on for the last year in Dawson Creek specifically before we move on to the other communities. So as pharmacists in each of the communities, we've been tracking medication assessments that we've been doing. So in Dawson Creek specifically, we've um, myself um, in collaboration with some of the practitioners in the area have done 57 different patient assessments. On average, the patients were 75 years old, pretty much even split between male and female on a number of baseline meds, anywhere between three and 25. And from those encounters, we made almost 200 recommendations, about 40% of which were medication discontinuations, diabetes medications, aspirin, hypertension meds, NSAIDs and PPIs. About a third were dose increases for certain indications. 21% were initiation of new medications. And then either a decrease in dose working towards discontinuation would be zofaclone, trazodone, gabapentin, PPIs, and diabetes medications. And before I pass it over to Christy to give a summary as a practitioner, just a couple takeaways that I've had over this past year is that we don't need to have dramatic reductions in the number of medications to have a benefit for a patient. A big piece of this is the cost of medication, the burden of medication and dosing time consolidation. So for example, there was a patient recently who was on, I think so upwards of 15 pills a day, various times throughout her blister pack. And with just a little bit of work and rescheduling, we got her down to five tablets in the morning and one tablet at supper that had all very similar therapeutic effect to what she had been taking before. So a lot of that consolidation is very important as well. Um, we need to keep in mind that the prescribers were not necessarily involved in all of these encounters. So it's uncertain if the recommendations were accepted or implemented. Um, pharmacists do have the knowledge and the skills to assess the appropriateness and the safety of medications, but lack that prescribing ability in the scope of practice, and that can create barriers to improving patient care. But that collaboration that Dr. Helm talked about earlier is essential in keeping that, that patient safe and making sure their medications are effective. And overall, I've had patients be very appreciative of the time spent on their in-depth review of their medications. They uh, report very, feeling very empowered to improve their health and that they now had a deeper understanding of their medications. So I'll pass it over to Christy if she has anything to add for Dawson Creek. I'll try and keep it brief, <laughs> as, as hard as that is. Um, so I'm a new family nurse practitioner here in Dawson Creek. I just graduated in 2019. And I have found this project to be very eye-opening um, as a practitioner, especially me starting a new practice. It has, in long story short, has always asked me to ask why. Why are these patients on these medications? Why do they need them? Do they still need them? And when you're going through their health history, you're going through their list of medications and I find it's, it's very easy for, for healthcare practitioners to just refill, refill, refill and not really ask why they're on them and against this toxic cycle. So I've been able to use that opportunity and, and actually have had quite, quite successes and a lot of people, you ask the patients, well, why are you on these medications? Well, I don't know. I was, I was prescribed it by XYZ three years ago and they're still on it. And so it's been very humbling and I've learned a ton. Um, one in particular, um, she isn't part of the study just because of her age, um, but it was just great collaboration between Dr. Perry, pharmacist Sharissa and I um, for a patient in Tumblr Ridge who um, was admitted to psych for anxiety and depression. Um, she'd had long sent long-standing depression, um, but when she was discharged, she was discharged on four um, psychiatric drugs and one for her tremoring, which she was told was not because of her medications, but because of intention tremors and was told this was her only option for treatment. Um, now, despite this, after she was discharged, I did her PHQ-9 for those as a depression scale and her scale was almost at the very max, even on those four medications, it was 20. 
And I, so between Sharissa, Tom and I, we have been able to wean her down to none. She's now on none of those medications and her, she has shown significant improvement in mood. She actually explained even in the first two weeks of us starting to cut down her medications, she described feeling less foggy, um, that she felt more of herself. And she actually explained going for a drive with her mom and she couldn't get over the beauty of the trees and the environment all around her because she had just been in such a fog for so long. It's like we had you know, given her, her life back and it was, it was a very momentous time, you know, even though, yes, our, our project was looking more at seniors, it just goes to show that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter the age, it seems to affect everybody, polypharmacy affects everybody, and just keeping your eyes open and, and asking why, and it, it makes a huge difference. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, Christy, I might add just <clears throat> briefly, uh, Charissa Tonis and also the pharmacist in Tumblr Ridge also worked with this patient and Christy got me involved in an initial fairly long Zoom interview. I, I can't remember, Christy, it was maybe an hour and a half or two hours, but we, uh, we didn't have a lot of background information to work on. And one of the struggles in uh, and de-prescribing in psychiatric patients is trying to get the history accurately and understand what's going on. And when you've never met the person before, that's actually a very complicated thing. And as people may know, the best psychiatrists tend to do that over a period of multiple visits and hours. And if it's in hospital, it could literally be many hours of observation and interviews. So it's challenging, but uh, this one, uh, seemed to work out very well. The last follow-up we did was from my uh, mobile phone from a broken down car, uh, borrowing somebody else's vehicle to sit in to be quiet and uh, somewhere in a Dawson Creek parking lot. <laughs> and it was very gratifying. Uh, do you want to stop there, Christy? And I'll move to Charissa's or? Yeah, that's that's okay. I, I know we can talk forever. <laughs> so it's over to you, Sharissa. So. so I'll start with just a uh, kind of an overview of what uh, and I were able to do over this past year. Um, so we had a slightly different um, uh, kind of uh, process here. I actually used my computer system at the pharmacy to identify people who qualified for uh, medication review who over the age of 65. Uh, so in BC, that requires being on five or more medications. Uh, so I, I ran the reports and came up with somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 people who fit the criteria, uh, and then kept that list in the pharmacy and over the course of the year, kind of tried to uh, talk to them as they came in to get their refills to, to talk to them about this program and see whether they were interested in doing a review. Um, so we ended up by the end of the year seeing 79 patients in total. Um, so of the ones that we didn't talk to, uh, nine had positions out of hands and kind of access to the chart. Uh, five people didn't want to do the program. Uh, four didn't qualify anymore. They, they had already discontinued medications and didn't have five anymore. Uh, two left town and one we just didn't have a chart. They had moved to town too recently and hadn't had any subsequent um, assessments done. I'll just get the next slide. So out of those 79 encounters, uh, we had people aged 65 to 88, um, about half and half, male, female. Um, baseline meds anywhere from five to 19 with an average of 10. Uh, and we made a total of 226 recommendations, 58% uh, to discontinue meds, 19 and a half to start meds, uh, 18 to decrease, uh, decrease doses and four and a half to increase doses. Um, and I think the, for me, like just in terms of takeaways, uh, I, I felt like I, that we could do things slowly. Like for some people we wanted to make seven or eight different changes, but um, didn't have to do that all at once. And the, the case that I'll present later kind of speaks to that. Um, Picking 
taking your battles and doing one or two things at a time and then knowing that in six six or 12 months you do the process again and, and see if there's something else that can be addressed uh, works just fine. And, and I would say, I would echo what Sydney and, and uh, Christy said, like people really enjoyed the process. They, uh, whether or not they had made major changes to their medications, they felt empowered, they felt knowledgeable, they felt like they'd been heard. Um, they felt like they'd had the time to, to kind of go through everything and, and really not forget things. We were able to kind of keep asking questions. What else? Like, is there something else that might be bothering you? Is there something that we haven't discussed? And, and being able to take that time was, was really great. Um, so this was um, kind of an interesting one. We actually saw this lady before the project started. Uh, Dr. Helm and I were already uh, seeing patients uh, together before that. Uh, so we had done an assessment in the spring of 2020, uh, and this was the result of that first assessment. Uh, she had had a uh, total knee replacement and was having troubles with pain subsequently. And uh, so she came to us, was having troubles with uh, orthostatic hypertension and confusion. Um, and so her doctor wanted us to, to uh, do what we could do to, sure. to help her. So... We made a few changes at the time. We reduced the dose of Tylenol-4. She had been on this post-surgery and uh, we got her from six tablets a day to four tablets a day. She had been using cyclobenzaprine twice a day. We managed to reduce that to once a day. Uh, and trazodone, she was using for sleep. We reduced from 200 to 100 milligrams. Uh, she had also been on gabapentin at the time, which didn't seem to be helping her with her pain at all. And we thought was contributing to some of the side effects that she was experiencing. And so we tapered her off of that as well. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide. Maybe you've already covered that. Uh... Yeah, I kind of have. So, so then as time was going on, uh, she was still having troubles with confusion, despite the changes we had made. The orthostatic hypertension seemed to have cleared up a bit. Um, but she was given a diagnosis of dementia over the, over the course of the summer. And so we saw her again in the fall um, and we picked away again. We, we, she was still on four tablets a day, Tylenol 4, but uh, we didn't touch that this time. But we did manage to get her to reduce her use of cyclobenzaprine from every day to just once uh, as needed. Um, her clonazepam dose that she'd been taking for anxiety, we tapered slowly down to about half of what she had been on before. Uh, so she went from one milligram in the morning and one and a half at night to 0.5 and 0.75. And she did really well with that. Um, the clomipramine was one that we had been trying to address for quite some time. Uh, her psychiatrist had actually noted that uh, it would be a good medication for her to discontinue probably two years earlier. Um, but she was very concerned. She had been on it for something like 20 years and she thought it was the only thing that was helping with her depression and anxiety. So she was very, very concerned about reducing that. And so we were able to take the time during the medication review to, to say, you can do this really slowly. You're not even gonna notice. So we set up a, a, a deal with her where we could taper the dose by 10 milligrams a month, um, do it so that she wouldn't even notice. And, uh, and she agreed to it. And, and so that was good. And we also looked at the corvostatin and realized that she didn't have uh, any, prior history to, to use it for secondary prevention. And so we got rid of that as well. Um, but it took quite a few months for us to get around to, to stopping her medications. And when we finally did, so now it's almost a year later and we, we started the process of tapering off of chemotherapy in May or June. Um, and we've now got her down to 40 milligrams at bedtime and she's already seeing a difference. She's come into me and, and and said that she can think more clearly. She's not confused all the time. She's already saying, I don't think I have dementia at all. And it was related to this medication that she's been on for, for 20 years. And I, I asked her if I could record her saying that to, to show a video, but she, she was too nervous to do it, but she did want to write a, a letter. And so I'm just going to read out a little bit of it to you. She said, my memory was just about gone. I was confused and my balance was getting really bad. I wanted everything to stop, but I kept trying. And then my pharmacist and doctor called with help, thank God. I'm not saying it was all easy, but with help, understanding, and encouragement, 
uh, they helped me and this program works and kind of why we're doing it. And so I, th I thought that was great. And, and I, I feel like this demonstrates that you have to kind of keep chipping away at things. And some, it takes many, many years for people to get to the situation where they're on this many medications. And it can take quite a long time to get them on less medications, but it, it's worth the effort. And I think that's all I had to say about that. Very good. Well, uh, Chetland, I've ended up displaying it slightly differently. It's, <clears throat> I haven't figured out how to use the spreadsheet very easily. <laughs> and uh, the maximum of, um, if you look here on the right, you'll see there were uh, 17 patients revert, referred for review. Um, a couple more have come from a uh, pharmacist working there, Mark Kunzley, and have yet to be um, completed, but uh, they, may, they may yet be done. Uh, one of them ultimately canceled at the last minute a Zoom appointment. And I had the, some records in PharmaNet already reviewed and prepared. So she counts as number 17, but she did not in fact participate. And of those um, 17 who were reviewed, the total number of drugs was 147, average is about 8.6. The range was, I think, uh, five up to 11 or 12, but uh, depends how you count drugs. If I didn't count um, over-the-counter vitamins or supplements, unless they appeared to have been recommended by a doctor. There are a lot of people in Chetwin getting vitamin B, 12, much of it apparently recommended by a doctor or a nurse practitioner in the past. And um, the initial uh, recommended, um, the initial recommendation from, uh, this was a medical interview with uh, a couple of exceptions when uh, pharmacist Mark Hunsley participated. Um, initially, Mostly I recommended stopping or reducing an average of about five drugs per person out of an average of um, 8.6. <laughs> so I was reasonably radical about that. Um, I, um, I also recommended, um, I'm sorry, just the way this is playing, I can't see that part myself. The, uh, I recommended starting a few. Uh, some of those, it's a little bit difficult to figure out how to record this if, if someone um, is taking esomeprazole, which is considerably more expensive than pantoprazole, uh, should that be recorded as one stop and one start? Um, I ended up today doing that, um, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, might be better not to record a stop nor a start, just call it a switch. And uh, then if, if one starts a combined inhaler, for example, long acting muscarinic um, with uh, long acting uh, beta agonist, should that be called one or two? I've called that two always. So of the 16, out of six, of the 16 people who wanted to participate and were followed up, they, they reduced from about 136 drugs altogether, which was a mean of 8.5, down to um, a much uh, significantly smaller mean. And I ended up actually struggling to count this just in the last minutes before this presentation, figure out what actually happened because at multiple follow-up visits, sometimes something gets added or let's say a nephrologist has added something. But you can see there's a significant amount um, I might have liked it to be a bit more. The one area where I could not accomplish anything was uh, uh, DPP-4 agonist gliptins, which have not been shown to change clinical outcomes in type 2 diabetes. So I don't personally see any role for them, but um, they had got uh, a strong foothold in the Chetwin area in the past. <laughs> People were reluctant to give them up because they do lower the A1C slightly. And I tried in a couple of occasions to convince people to try um, an SGLT2 inhibitor with a split dose to save money. One, one person tried it and said it made it very difficult or hurt to urinate. So he didn't get beyond a week of that despite 
being a fairly good candidate having a heart failure as well as type 2 diabetes. So some of the things I noticed were, um, it's, it's tricky to figure out how you should count drugs. Um, the common things that were fairly easy recommendations to make and that the patients seemed to like were in primary prevention or in uh, extreme old age and uh, near death from malignancy, stopping aspirin, statins, beta blockers, stopping vitamin B12 where there was no clear indication for it, uh, and usually recommending that that be followed up afterwards in, ca in case it was a metformin induced uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or an independent B12 deficiency, which is sometimes very hard to find out because it may go back decades in history. And uh, it was common to switch. This was often a recommendation from the consulting pharmacist, Mark Kunsley. And insulin dose, it's, kind of, it's rather difficult to figure out how to record those. If, you know, if, if somebody reduces their short acting insulin by two units twice a day <laughs> from 14 units to 12, you know, <laughs> does that really count as deprescribing or not? Um, Whereas if they change from, um, I think there was one patient taking two different long acting insulins, uh, that certainly is useful and saves a lot of money. And the, the single thing that struck me the most as I reported in February when we had a group meeting is I was astounded how much time it took me to do this and to record it properly in such a way that it might be useful in Chetwin to doctors who don't actually know me. And uh, I think my record was about seven hours for one case, trying only maybe an hour, hour and a half to do the interview, um, what you could make of a physical exam, but a long time to figure out how to record it in such a way that it would be useful. So that's, that's an ongoing challenge, particularly if we think about uh, telehealth in BC and some of the sensitivities that Sydney and uh, Christy and Charissa have already referred to what if what if the patient is scared or worried or doesn't want to stop something or doesn't care about the costs? How does one communicate that in a constructive way? So I, I learned quite a bit from this, I think, as well. And I believe it's back to Charles now as chair, and um, we could. Um, have some discussion at this point and, uh, and invite questions, I think. I might stop sharing for a moment in case that makes it easier for people to see each other. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And um, I've got to say that those two cases that uh, Christy and Charissa presented, um, on the one hand, they're absolutely remarkable. On the other hand, I'm not surprised having seen this in progress for the last year. This is exactly the kind of results that we get. And as Sharisa pointed out, it sometimes does take perseverance. And for me, some of the cases where you seemingly reverse dementia or there was that gentleman who we stopped to statin and then he wanted to go out fly fishing, whereas previously he couldn't brush his teeth. Um, another case where an internist had been pushing insulin up and up and up and we somehow had the confidence to say let's try and get you off insulin <laughs> so I've never in 40 years uh, had a, an example of where I've sort of disagreed with an internist um, and, and had the confidence to actually do something about it um, so the, those are some of the, um, the the really powerful memories for me and um, to me there's an irony in that one can achieve these incredible things in medicine essentially by reversing what colleagues have done over the last heaven knows how many years and just we keep on refilling and I look back on my career and how often I would just refill three months refill six months because it's the easy thing to do um, so for me it's been a privilege um, towards the end of my career to be able to try and reverse some of those mistakes that um, I must have made for a long time. Um, from our side in Tumblr Ridge, we started off with a newspaper article inviting people to become part of this. And I was just saying to Sharisa today, we need to send another letter, uh, uh, article to the newspaper just to 
So here's what we've done. Um, we kind of, <laughs> our three communities in the peace region, we're kind of globally unique in what we've done and we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have, something like that. But um, Tom, you are going to be giving the anticholinergic talk, but I think this maybe is just a time if there are any questions um, from anybody at this stage on what we've heard so far. Um, now would be the time to any of us um, who have spoken just to fire off a question or else via the chat. Um, so yeah, are there, are, there any, are there any questions that anybody has for what we've, what we've done? Or comments. Uh, we've got a, a distinguished colleague in Toronto who is listening in and we hope and expect to be joining the therapeutics initiative before long. Uh, Dr. Wade Thompson is an academic pharmacist in Toronto who has done a lot of work in polypharmacy uh, in Canada and in Denmark. And Wade, if you want to make any comments or, or fail Liam, as I see in uh, Nanaimo, uh, I think there might have been a few other people who might have joined us, but they got the wrong link. But if anybody wants, and anybody else, I, are, there's some of Sydney's uh, pharmacy residents or students but anyone should feel free to comment if they wish. I'll just say that, I mean, it was amazing to hear about some of these, these stories. Cause yeah, as Tom alluded to, I'm, I'm, I practice, but I'm in the research world a lot. And it's really nice to hear just like some of these real life stories about some of the, the improvements that you've made in patients' lives. Um, and I think it's pretty illuminating probably for a lot of, of people in, in academia to, to hear about this kind of stuff. So I, yeah, I just say thanks um, for sharing this, this uh, work. It's really cool stuff. So you've been struggling with this uh, as a clinical pharmacist in Nanaimo. Is there anything that surprises you here or not? That sounds really familiar. It's great to hear this work is going on elsewhere as well. And um, yeah, it is, uh, it's incredibly, incredible to be part of the process. And it's really neat how you guys have established teams um, to help kind of, you know, in increase that collaboration because that's really part of it. And the, you know, if everyone on that patient, that patient's care team can be on the same page, that's huge. And to support that person with those changes, because as Sharissa mentioned, there, there is fear sometimes. I mean, when these patients have been on medications for decades and now all of a sudden someone's telling them that actually might be a problem. Um, there can be some hesitancy to change. Um, but if everyone's supporting them with that on their care team, I think that's um, support's huge for change, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for the invite, Tom. It's great to hear these stories. Thank you for joining us. Sydney, I, if you're still there, do any of your students or residents want to say something, do you think? Yes, Cody, Nicole, and Catherine are all students with Val and I over the next couple of months. So <laughs> we, we've been talking a little bit about the project. So if they have anything to add, feel free to chime in, guys. I do have a bit of a question. I'm not too sure who can answer it or if there is an answer even, but um, so we were talk, I was talking with Sydney this morning about the project and how um, she implemented a lot of changes, but she wasn't necessarily sure if they were accepted by the physicians. I'm just wondering, as a pharmacist in British Columbia, there's not a huge amount of prescribing abilities. So I'm wondering what's the best way to kind of collaborate with other healthcare providers in the clinic um, so that you can kind of get them on board with the deprescribing and hopefully actually get these changes implemented. Yeah, Nicole, I can try to answer that for you. So in Tumblr Ridge, we, after we'd been doing this for a few months, we set up um, a Zoom meeting with the three practicing physicians in Tumblr Ridge and said, you know, here's what we're doing. Is it going down well? Do you like what we're doing? Are there any problems that you've got that you'd like to relate to us so we can improve? Etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Akanabu is with us um, this evening as one of the physicians from Tumblr Ridge, but the, the feedback we got was, you know, very, um, very positive and saying this is, you know, it's just out the blue. Here comes these 
because the physicians would receive a detailed letter from us with all the recommendations and so would the patient. So the patient would receive a, you know, their letter and the physician would receive a different letter. So you, you're quite right. And that is the one question, how do we, you know, it's one thing to make a recommendation, it's another thing for it to be accepted. So how would we do that? And we just, in small towns, it's so easy. You just set up a meeting and we all know each other and we all understand each other and we upfront with each other. So it, it gave the physicians the opportunity to give us feedback. That was the best way we could think of doing it. But that's that's a really good question. And thank you. Thank you. I think also the development of PCNs has it's it's very slow up here for that happening. I'm I'm actually the first um, PCN and P. Um, but we are starting to see small change, like with Sydney coming and being in all of the different practices in Dawson one, one day a week. I know you guys have probably seen a little bit of it, but like having her in our office once a week, physically there so that I, she's my resource. I just literally walk up to her desk and I can ask her questions or if she has questions, it's face-to-face -face communication and she has direct patient contact so that we develop relationships as it's a multidisciplinary team instead of it being so disjointed and you know just communicating via fax, which ends up being more of the case in larger centers. But when you have a face to the name, it really does make a difference. And when you have that trusting relationship, like Sydney and I, you know, if Sydney makes recommendations, she doesn't even have to ask me because I just because we are we trust each other and I know I trust her, her decision-making. So, you know, it's that much better of a flow. Um, so you hope that they can find ways that I hope other PCNs do the same because a lot of them, you know, they work under the same roof. So hopefully they have the same type of relationships, but I think it's a start anyways. I'm curious whether uh, Charlie who runs the division of family practice or uh, Trisha or anyone else has a comment on on the difficulty of getting more doctors involved. It's, um, I would say that's one slightly disappointing aspect of the project from my point of view, but not surprising for, for any of you who aren't in uh, the South Peace District, uh, you might not be aware how difficult the medical supply uh, issue has been up there. And Chetwin, one of the reasons that I became involved directly was there was a uh, a pretty critical doctor shortage and a complete turnover happened last year and it, it became evident that uh, to the clinic staff there that the, to the public primary health clinic that um, nothing was going to happen. There was an interesting pharmacist. To, so I had offered to help out and that I, I, I'm very glad that I did and I had the chance, but that's why the specialist ended up. But one thing we've heard um, in the therapeutics initiative recently when we proposed a, an uh, um, optimal prescribing course from our partners in UBC continuing professional development, they ran the course outlined by some of their family practice consultants who said, uh, in effect, leave the poor doctors alone. They're completely swamped with COVID, with changes in primary care, with record keeping, with college standards. <laughs> They're not, this might be good for the patients, but it won't be good for the doctors, this course. So why would they take it? Which wasn't what we were hoping to hear, but uh, we've stopped and postponed the course until we can answer that question. I don't know, Charlie or Trisha or Charles, do you have any, or anybody else? I'm, since this well, is- you're, the, you, you're quite right, Tom, and you've mentioned Chetwind, but I mean, right now, Chetwind is actually doing pretty well. I think Jody could confirm there's a whole new cohort of wonderful docs in Chetwind, but Dawson Creek is now really struggling, you know, to even maintain a, an emergency room physician on call, you know, um, possibly the only community in, 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 in BC at the moment in that unfortunate stage. So. You know, people are just overwhelmed and um, it's, it's, it's a real struggle. And so something like this, you can quite understand why this isn't, you know, top of the agenda because, you know, just finding docs to work emerge shifts and so on. It's, it's, um, it must be really difficult. So somehow we have persevered and got through this and, 
you know, in spite of those challenges. And I think just the final thing I should mention, um, which just for, especially for our guests, our special guests, and thanks so much um, to those of you who are joining us from afar, but just to, Sharissa and I would spend at least one hour for each of these um, consultations, at least an hour. Sometimes we'd go as long as an hour and a half if it demanded. And that's how long it, it takes. You cannot do this in, in a 10, 15 minutes. It just, it's not possible. But the result of making it an hour long is that you have the time to empower your patients, um, to let them feel that to a much greater degree than they ever thought they are in control of what they're on and what they're not on. It's many of these things you say, yeah, you really should be on this, but so many you say, well, this is really up to you. And our job is to explain what the benefits are and what the risks are, and then you are in control. You need to decide. And that's an eye opener for so many people. And at the end of it, when they get their letter and they come back to Sharissa a few days or weeks later, there is gratitude of a kind that I have seldom seen. And but it's because it's an hour, it's because it's physician and pharmacist together. You know, we've really developed a way to do this that works. And I'm just hoping that we do have the opportunity in the forthcoming months and year or whatever to spread that to a wider audience. But um, so yeah, so it's an hour long. That's the, that's the point, that's the bottom line. Do, um, Charlie, are you gonna say anything or do you want me to move on? Just add, I mean, naturally change is hard in any community. So of course we have been faced with challenges, but something that I think is really important about this project is the sustainability. So there is commitment from the working group to be able to move forward with this work long-term. So being able to create that spread, we naturally have champions that sat on our working group and they have done an amazing job to develop strategies of how this can work in a community and how this can be successful. And even though we had limited resources, we now have the ability to show how this work is so meaningful and how it changes patients' lives and be able to spread that throughout the South Peace. So that really would be our hope is that this isn't a stopping point, that we have the ability to do that change management and continue the spread of this amazing work. Well, we're, um... We're hoping to be continue to be invited to be involved in that in the therapeutics initiative, not just Lena, but uh, I hope in the near future, Wade and and others. Um, shall I move Charles to the uh, the didactic part? Yeah, sure, Tom. That's great. Thank you. If you could, some people will have to leave. I think uh, Sydney and uh, Charissa have to leave, but their cats are welcome to stay and continue to participate. <laughs> I'll just get back to sharing the screen. Um, this part we were, oops, let's see. We were, um, we were going to start with this, but I'm glad that we didn't. Uh, I'm glad we did it the other way around. Uh, let's see, go, there we are. So uh, I hope I can interest you in, um, Uh, make some things a little more real than they might be for those who are, uh, for example, the pharmacy students who are hearing a, a theory only. This is just behaving a little bit oddly, but I think it'll behave. Um, I modified very slightly what I had um, gone into the poster, but um, the goal is to encourage uh, people who are working clinically that You'll be after you watch this, you'll be better able to interview patients and examine them for at least five different potential adverse effects of anticholinergic drugs. For those who are familiar that drugs, um, uh, the famous mnemonic, uh, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, et cetera, um, dry as a desert or dry as a bone. I don't think in general patients want us to be assessing how much sweat they have on their bodies, but um, if you're an experienced clinician and, and like Charles and I are, were trained to examine the axilla thoroughly, um, I think it would be both obvious and rather nice if somebody had no sweat in the axilla 
<laughs> sometime. But whether we would have been astute enough to suspect an anticholinergic drug, I, I wouldn't count on it myself. Uh, another important part is recognize and, and know the harm so that it becomes kind of routine to ask when you know the medication administration record or PharmaNet or any form of drug list, when you see certain drugs that uh, you recognize are potentially or certainly anticholinergic that you'll um, look for the harms. And the uh, ability uh, finally, we're going to touch very briefly on cholinesterase inhibitors, which are the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, because I think that was one of about 12 topics we identified at the beginning of the project last year as something we should cover. So uh, everything I'm going to cover is really uh, reviewed quite nicely in the therapeutics initiative letter from uh, three years ago. If any of you aren't familiar with the therapeutics initiative, it's a chance for me to blow our horn. We're uh, an independent academic group at UBC in the department uh, was pharmacology and therapeutics. It became subsumed by anesthesiology. So it's now anesthesiology, pharmacology, and therapeutics in the medical school. And uh, we're quite unpopular with the drug industry, but uh, popular and have a very good reputation around the world for accurate analysis of drugs and high quality information. And one of the things that I think we've done best over the years is that our therapeutics letters are brief and uh, very high quality and essentially really have never been challenged. It's, it's possible one or two got the odd thing wrong, uh, but basically not. Uh, and this is an example, it's a two, they're all generally two pages, so it's very hard to find any information that's that succinct. But this one pointed out, um, reminded people of uh, the anti-muscarinic qualities of uh, anticholinergic drugs. And on the right is an illustration used in the United Kingdom to try to make the same point. I have covered over one which was incorrect in this illustration, which alleged that anticholinergic drugs lower blood pressure. And when I asked the authors, uh, where did that come from? Um, I can't, I'm not familiar with that and I can't find anyone who agrees. Uh, they pointed out, oh, we think it came from a geriatrician who said that uh, nortriptyline lowers blood pressure. And they were confusing a blockade of muscarinic cholinergic receptors with blockade of alpha receptors. So the important things to think about, I've numbered them in this case, I've added numbers, the brain, the eyes, the mouth, uh, the skin, if you want, I'm paying more attention to the bowel and uh, the entire bowel from the esophagus down, or even the back of the throat, the pharynx and the bladder, and we'll cover, we'll cover those. If you want more, go back and look up that letter. And if you uh, choose to register with the Therapeutics Initiative, ti.ubc.ca, you receive these aut letters automatically. Pri privacy laws mean we can't just sign up one of you who says nods and says, I'd like to be signed up. You have, must do that yourself, but it's free. So remember, acetylcholine acts at basically two types of receptors. There are subtypes, but we're interested in the muscarinic receptors, which were named, I guess, in the night, uh, early 20th century after muscarine, which is a component of poisonous mushrooms. And we're talking about the parasympathetic nervous system. And if I think back, I. I had to add this slide thinking, when have I ever used an anticholinergic therapeutically? Uh, very, very seldom. Uh, maybe I did in 30 years ago, but I sort of learned that they're not usually a very nice drug to take. They are prescribed occasionally. Uh, Buscopan is a brand name of hyacin, and I think it has something else in it. Probably the most common thing one sees that's deliberate is treatment for overactive bladder, typically, um, women, but one of the men in Chetwind had received it from a urologist had oxybutynin for quote unquote overactive bladder. That's one of the drugs that was stopped that he never missed. Uh, scopolamine as a patch, for example, dimenhydrinate, when you think about it, it's uh, the 
diphenhydramine component of dimenhydramate, which is, in case anybody doesn't know, dimenhydramate is a combination of, it's not racemic, it's diphenhydramine, approximately 25 milligrams, and 8-chlorothiophylin, which was added in the 1940s in the hope that it would counteract the sedation from diphenhydramine, but doesn't work. And because they're roughly the same molecular size, 50 milligrams of dimenhydronate has 25 of diphenhydramine approximately and 25 of 8 chlorothiophylin. But that's pr presumably working uh, on nausea mostly as an anticholinergic in the same way that scopolamine does. And then these, of course, we use and they're actually fairly productive in the right circumstance. And this certainly works uh, for profound bradycardia, for example, in the setting of inferior myocardial infarction or sometimes cardiac arrests. If you think on the benefit side, again, if this interests you, there are a number of therapeutics letters, three that deal with this class of drugs. Um, the, um, the benefits in terms of symptomatic benefit where the patient says in clinical trials, yeah, overall, I'm, I'm glad you gave me that. I'm better. It would be between one and six to seven people. So the chance if we prescribe it that somebody's going to actually like it, if they're honest, is not very high. And if you're thinking about uh, the most, probably the most important reason you might use it, if it could make the difference between wearing a, an incontinence pad or not, it's not probably going to prevent you from having to wear an incontinence pad. If it did, perhaps it would be worth putting up with the harms. Uh, one in five complain of a dry mouth, but is that the real number who have it or is it everybody? I think from a medical perspective, it's everybody. And one in 40 get a serious adverse event. Serious adverse event, for those who don't know, is, the, is defined internationally as something that causes hospitalization prolong, or death, prolongs hospitalization, causes permanent disability, birth defect, cancer. It's not just going to the emergency room. So a serious adverse event might be urinary retention leading to hospitalization or worse. Let's say catheter and then infection and uh, possibly death. Or, or say um, delirium uh, from an anticholinergic drug causing hospitalization. So here's, here's something. Uh, Two recent patient reports. One, I'm going to come back to Sharissa's patient in a moment, but this one came from a nurse practitioner in primary care in Vancouver who sent me an email saying her patient with trauma-related PTSD had had two years of severe dyspepsia and regurgitation, several upper endoscopies trying to figure it out, and had been taking amitriptyline for nightmares. Uh, I think the nurse practitioner stopped the amitriptyline and the GI symptoms resolved. And the psychiatrist who had prescribed it said he will report this to Health Canada, which bully for him, that's the first time I've heard of a psychiatrist reporting an ADR to Health Canada. Good for him, but he says it's not a known side effect of amitriptyline. So the woman, young woman who sent this to me found that both funny and disturbing. I think it's very disturbing, but also very interesting because it, um, it brings home for me something that I've thought of mostly as theory. If you have a very dry mouth, it is harder to swallow. And if it's harder to swallow, you're probably also paralyzing your stomach to some extent. And if you have food with or without acid in there, and then you lie down, if your stomach hasn't emptied, you're more likely to regurgitate. So this is one of the important uh, adverse effects I think we should always be looking for. And see what you think of this woman, if it reminds you of what that anecdote just said. What was the reason you were taking the amitriptyline? I just started it, it to help me sleep more. I really didn't realize until I started, you know, talking about it, that it's probably aggravating some of my symptoms. For instance, I have problems swallowing. And I have a, um, post -nasal drip. I have a very, very hard time 
with dry mouth. And I've increased the um, amitriptyline because I've had more trouble sleeping. And from that, I've had, um, I found I've had constipation and trouble, I miss the word peeing, peeing. I feel I need to go, I want to go, but it takes me, sometimes it takes me ages to actually be able to go when I'm in the washroom. And what's the difficulty you've had that the speech therapist describes? It's hard sometimes when I'm, I'm eating a meal at night or, or during the day. Um, I just have to stop and really physically swallow. Had you made any connection to the, the dryness in your mouth and the fact you were taking a, a drug every day? No, absolutely not. What was your own explanation of why it was so difficult to urinate? I, I didn't understand it. I knew that there was something happening because I didn't ever have that problem before. And what about your bowel movements? Um, but since I have increased the yeah, uh, amitriptyline, um, it's, it's been um, just like little pellets. When you took it as a sleeping pill, would, would you expect in your own mind's eye that it, uh, you take it and by morning it's gone? Or how, how do you conceive of a sleeping pill? I just feel that it helps me sleep. And when I get up in the morning, the effects have worn off. I see. And do you think that's the case or not? Yes. Why did you keep taking it then if it wasn't helping? Because I thought I'd be in a worse state if I stopped it. So she's wrong. It's not gone in, uh, in the morning. It's mostly still there in the morning. And as long as she keeps taking it, it's in her brain and in her parasympathetic nerve endings and everywhere else in her body around the clock. Um, so we've covered three of the points in this diagram here, the reduced saliva, the reduced gel mortality, the bladder emptying. Shall we go for number four? Uh, we come back to um, Charissa's case uh, in which the psychiatrist suggested reducing or stopping clomipramine. And I think we heard a moment ago that uh, this is being worked on. But I, if I heard correctly, she's down to 40, 40 milligrams a day of clomipramine. So uh, my experience in clinical pharmacology does not see that as a low dose. I, I think a low dose is zero. And if you think about the number of molecules of these drugs, if you remember Avogadro's number um, and the molecular weights, which are typically going to be less than a thousand grams per mole, um, you've got something like 18, 19, 20 times, uh, sorry, uh, 6.02 times 8, 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 18th, 19th, 20th power. It's an inconceivable number of molecules. So if you reduce that in half, you still have an inconceivable number of molecules. So I think that's a better way to look at these drugs. But I thought it's useful to look, um, somebody mentioned uh, earlier, or maybe it was, uh, in a similar presentation I gave at lunch today in Vancouver Island, the uh, wasn't aware of cyclobenzaprine's properties. If you look at these drugs, this is the prototype. Well, the original prototype tricyclic was imipramine, which has got a slight, it's got a double bond in, in here, but amitriptyline has two methyl groups on the, on the nitrogen side chain. Nortriptyline, the nor stands for a German without the methyl, as in noradrenaline or norepinephrine. So you could call this also desmethyl amitriptyline. One methyl has been uh, stripped away and there's a hydrogen instead. Cyclobenzaprine, it's pretty darn similar. When, to my eye, when I look at this molecule, the difference is that double bond there. The side chain is identical to amitriptyline. And chlorimepramine, we call it in Canada clomipramine. In Europe, it's chlorimepramine, it has a chlorine here. The central ring is slightly different. It's got a nitrogen in it. Uh, if you took away the chlor chlorine atom, you would have imipramine. Also, it has these two methyls on the side chain. If you take one of those away, you have desmethyl cl chlorimepramine, or you could call it norchlorimepramine, which is also active. So all of these drugs, it's a useful rule to remember that 
they all have active metabolites. They're all very long acting and they're all potently, uh, potently inhibit mustarinic cholinergic synapses uh, or receptors, as well as alpha blockade and as well as histamine and they're, they're very, very dirty drugs, so to speak. So, you know, if, they're, if we're, if we're um, giving them uh, deliberately to affect the brain, um, they're going to block acetylcholine at brain synapses as well. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, if you believe that Alzheimer's disease is a disease in which cholinergic neurons die off and there's quote unquote a deficiency of acetylcholine, and therefore we give drugs to try to increase acetylcholine, would you want to deliberately increase, decrease its actions? Uh, believe it or not, I have seen geriatricians prescribing uh, drugs for dementia at the same time as oxybutynin and defending it and saying, well, no, I'm, I'm you know, that's in um, Charles Help Me Out, that famous English novel about the, that had the push me, pull me animal in it. Dr. Doolittle, is it? There's an animal push me, pull me. It's got two, it's like a llama with heads at both ends of the animal going in different directions. <laughs> we'll give a blocker to block the effect and we'll give a cholinesterase inhibitor to increase the amount of the drug. Anyway, this is the important thing. Remember that an anticholinergic drug can impair thinking, cause confusion, delirium, and this would be a spectrum. So I wouldn't want to be trying to present this under the influence of such a drug. Okay, what about this one? This is the fifth area. Is it all right if I make this recording for possible teaching use? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, forever. And the shakiness gets it down. Um, yes. The reason I made that video was that I started laughing when that woman pulled 13 drugs out of her purse. <laughs> I think we got my video camera here. Would you possibly consider putting them back in the purse while I run and get the camera? And she was very good humored about it, allowed me to make it. But as I watched her in real time and tried to think about her drugs, um, I thought she was just vain and she didn't want to use her glasses to read. And you can see that she's really squinting, trying to read the label. She's like me without trying to read something without my eyeglasses. It's currently hopeless. If I were on the face of the sun and had that much light, I might be able to get my pupils small enough to do it. But I have to use lenses now. And there are a number of drugs. The obvious one is cyclobenzaprine, but mirtazapine is another. Diamond hydronate, she was taking over the counter, so it didn't show up in Pharmanet. Morphine, maybe even lefaxine. If you look up these drugs and look in a product monograph and uh, or, or ask, say, in a Google search, is it does it block muscarinic receptors? Sometimes you can find a, an answer pretty easily, but um, let's just move on. I'm going to show you what she looked like without. Um, wait. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, here we are. Go. The first video I made with you, you were kind of peering at the medicine capsule. I couldn't read them. I thought you were just missing your eyeglasses. I, I have had my eyes checked. I've been told I have the eyes of a 16 year old. He said, you need glasses only for when you're doing your crafts, you know, to magnify something. So when you were taking cyclobenzaprine and other drugs, do you think you were having trouble focusing your eyes? Yes. Tell me, why do you think I didn't read? Oh, this is my new sleeping pill. Oh, that's, well, I'm gonna skip from that. <laughs> After I do prescribe a lot for her, her GP then she kept, complaining she couldn't sleep, so he gave her quetiapine, which is also a muscarinic antagonist. Technically, quetiapine isn't, but its active metabolite, nor quetiapine, is. If you look at, for especially for the pharmacy students, if you look at the product monograph and search for uh, muscarinic or anticholinergic, you have to look fairly closely. It, it will tell you that quetiapine does not interact at muscarinic cholinergic receptors, but 
norcotypine does. Only sometimes they'll confuse you more. They call it desalkyl quetiapine without the alkyl ALKYL group, which in this case is a methyl group. It's sort of almost designed to make it hard to learn. So what is it, what if the, we, we've covered all the acute effects, but what if there were chronic effects? Like what if the equivalent of delirium or confusion acutely is dementia chronically? And one of the concerns about anticholinergic drugs is that in um, population studies or case control studies, it looks very strongly as if they increase the probability of getting dementia by as much as 50%. So I don't know about you, but my probability at age 70 is still something like one in six. And a 50% increase would bump that up to one in four, which does not interest me. <laughs> and you know, this is something we can never prove because controlled trials don't run that long, but there are a number of uh, studies suggesting we should be worried about this. If you're messing with uh, visual acuity, you know, what happens to accidents? And in salivation, dentists know this very well, much better than doctors or pharmacists, reducing saliva increases dental decay. And this is, this is not a minor issue. This is like losing all of your teeth, potentially. And what about elocution and swallowing? You know, the ability to speak clearly depends partly on having some moisture in the mouth. And intestinal, uh, Motility, probably constipation is the biggest long-term issue, but if your bladder doesn't empty well, what about retention, acute kidney injury, and urinary tract infections? What if you're an elderly woman who can't empty well? You're almost certainly more vulnerable to that. So I think these are all good reasons to just know this stuff well. Um, Charles, should I keep going till 7.30 or not? Yeah, that's great, Tom. I think um, we've pretty much had the discussion se section already, so I think you're welcome to keep going till 7.30, absolutely. Okay. I'm just going to show you a few more interesting things where, uh, let me think, I want this to begin a little I bit have later. Um, this woman had terrible chronic cough and uh, was sent to me because nobody in Victoria could uh, figure out what to do about it. Her, her daughter headbutted her in bed. <laughs> That's what started off the cough and then she couldn't get rid of it. And eventually morphine in the same way as codeine would suppress cough. Yeah. But at this point- and Like I said, that's just, that's just so I can actually <laughs> have a good life. I haven't had any Benadryl today. <laughs> a question that I actually asked Dr. Perry that was quite interesting is, Part of my job, of course, like everyone, is the use of a BlackBerry. What happens is I'll look down on my BlackBerry, and it can be for a very short amount of time, 30 seconds, whatever. When I look back up, I have to, it takes me anywhere from 15, 20 minutes to regain my vision. Um, yeah, everything's extremely blurry, um, whether it be near or far. It's just I can't focus on anything. A long drive, sometimes you were almost seeing things. And on some of the drives, of course, like there's six, seven hours, and I'm consuming all this Benadryl. And I said, would that be why I'm driving along? And all of a sudden, I'm seeing things right in front of me, and I'm going, whoa. And it startles me, and I'm going, okay, there was nothing there. But um, I've never had that happen before either. So and what about your bladder also? <laughs> Um, I'm always going to the washroom because it never seems to empty. I mean, I've tried all the tricks. I've read the book on the internet and they say stand up when you're peeing and the rest of the stuff, but um, I'm constantly going to the bathroom. It never seems to empty and uh, it's bad to the point where, you know, if I'm coughing, I, I, I have to wear a pad most of the time because I do have leaks and stuff because it just never fully empties. Um, by the way, her daughter um, doesn't have ADHD, or we should resist that diagnosis. She's just incredibly bored because it was a long interview and then the video camera came out. Uh, so uh, this is the fourth objective, learning objective. Uh, I'm going to switch fields now. I think we've covered the, the five major issues. Um, 
with uh, anticholinergic drugs. What about and trying to increase acetylcholine? Um, there are three drugs available in Canada that do this, denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. Denepazil has a long elimination half-life. So you think about it, if you, if you wanted to reach equilibrium at any one dose, you might need four or five half-lives, which is going to be about two weeks. With rivastigmine, it's much shorter. And if I remember right, it was meant to be taken twice a day. And the manufacturer decided to make more money and get around the inconvenience by bringing out a patch which when you think about it, enforces adherence or compliance by the, um, by the patient, uh, which may not be a good thing. Galantamine is sort of in between and there's no reliable evidence for any one over the others. But uh, where does this come from? If you, well, I said remember, but maybe you have to be Charles or my age to remember this. Maybe nobody's being taught this anymore. <laughs> um, there was the hypothesis based on autopsy of people dying from Alzheimer's disease that there was a selective deficiency of acetylcholine in the brain in particular brain regions. And now the last 20 years or so, the dominant hypothesis has been amyloid hypothesis and various monoclonal antibodies targeted at that have failed abysmally. So that's being abandoned also. But if you go back to the 1980s, it was thought Oh, if we could raise uh, acetylcholine, people will be better. And this, this came from the observation that in Parkinson's disease, dopaminergic transmission was reduced. And it turned out that once that was learned in the 1960s and people figured out that the precursor L-dopa can get uh, given with carbidopa in particular can get into the brain and becomes dopamine. People get better with Parkinson's disease. That was the basis for trying to develop a, th a therapy that would raise acetylcholine in brain. Um, but it turns out uh, it doesn't parallel <laughs> Parkinson's disease, unfortunately. And again, uh, you know, if you're interested in this, I recommend you to the letter we wrote. It's now 16 years ago, but it's still accurate. Um, we were amongst the first people in the world to say this, that these drugs don't really work. And it nearly led to our abolition as an academic group. The, uh, the industry put intense pressure on government to get rid of us because this had the potential. British Columbia sales, 4 million people at the time was nothing but the potential. What if this word gets out elsewhere in the world that could have threatened billions of dollars? The, the average effect is a one point difference on a 30 point scale. So the, any of you who have ever administered a miniminal status exam will know that mm -hmm. a patient could easily fluctuate, including us. If we say today it's Wednesday, not Thursday, we could lose one point. Or if we get the, the numerical date wrong, or if we accidentally said it's October or August. Um, there's no difference with these drugs as shown experimentally in function or in having to be institutionalized. And on the, on the other hand, they do cause, as you would expect, if you think of the opposite of anticholinergic, promoting acetylcholine's effects. This is not something you'd like if you were uh, on a crowded bus that's not going to stop. Um, let's say you're trying to escape from an unpleasant place like Afghanistan and you don't really want to have diarrhea on that bus if you can help it. So you wouldn't want to be given one of these drugs. And one thing that we tend to forget a lot, including in hospitals, I think, is that uh, acetylcholine also is nicotinic and acts on nicotinic receptors and causes muscle contraction. So if a patient had muscle cramps, for example, in their calves, could this be promoting the, the promotion of the effect of acetylcholine and incontinence, both urinary and fecal? And we think from our original analyses, about one in 50 people get a serious adverse event, which means something very bad happens to them. It never quite reached statistical significance, but if you knew one in 50 uh, had that happen and the probability that P was 0 0.09 or 0 0.51, would you be keen on taking it? I don't think so. So I'm almost finished now, um, I think. Interestingly, uh, two years ago, the uh, 
uh, Agency for Health Quality and Review in the US published their review and come to very similar conclusions. They, they also cover memantine, which is a drug that has no effect <laughs> really. And they say they slightly reduce short-term cognitive decline, which really means on a scale like the mini mental status or a fancier scale. And they slightly reduced reported functional decline. Again, this would be on a scale, but the differences versus placebo are of uncertain clinical importance. So the conclusions I still draw are, we should resist prescribing these, even when the family says, um, well, we're desperate, you know, it's a horrible disease. He or she is going downhill steadily. Won't you please do something? You know, do it if you have to, but don't expect it to help the person and expect it has a serious chance of harming your patient. And don't prescribe with anticholinergics. I mean, don't be that crazy as the push me, pull me that goes in both directions at once. And if the person is, if a person is taking these typically in a care setting, um, if they're in a hospital or in a long-term care, they're probably helpless to defend their own interests. So if they have incontinence, diarrhea, weight loss, anorexia, the worst example I've seen is where a drug rep got into a care home in Vancouver and conned the staff into giving rivastigmine patch, which I think is put on a week at a time and the patient can't escape from it. And these patients were losing their appetite, vomiting and losing weight rapidly. And a, a geriatrician colleague went in there and found about, out about it and put a stop to it, which is obviously completely unethical, but Unfortunately, that kind of story doesn't tend to get published. So that's, oh, uh, gee, I'm done. Um, we can go back to um, screen and uh, hopefully that um, showed you something you may have learned about but didn't fully understand. Um, the last thing I'll say is I learned about the effect on uh, visual accommodation when I took Desipramine at a small dose twice in Sweden, two different occasions as, as, as part of an experiment. And it, it messed with my brain and coordination to the extent that I was 35 then and I was a very good typist. And I felt very much as if I had taken uh, uh, a single beer would mess with my typing. So it was subtle, but it was real. And it really messed with my ability to go from near to far in focus from, to look down at the keyboard and then look up again and have to kind of hunt to focus. So if you're asking a patient about it, the most sensitive question is not, uh, do you have blurred vision or blurry vision? It's, do you have difficulty adjusting your vision from near to far? And if you want to know what it's like, um, technically, in your, if you're a health professional, it's not okay to try something yourself. But if you ever get the chance, if someone wants to prescribe it to you, say, yeah, can I have five of them or, or two, please, <laughs> rather than a whole week's supply? <laughs> or get the week's supply, <laughs> try it out and, and observe yourself. So I, I found also the effect on my intestine was profound mm. and would have been very helpful if I were trying to escape from Afghanistan on a bus. Um, but I wouldn't want it any other time. And at age 70, I sure as hell wouldn't want it with, ref with respect to benign <laughs> prostatic hyperplasia. Thanks, but no thanks. No anticholinergic for me. Are there any questions or discussion or Charles, are you gonna, or Charlie, you're gonna do any wrap up if not? Well, no, Tom, that was a lovely uh, talk. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned the word desperate and, you know, families and patients are absolutely desperate when they're dealing with what seems to be dementia and our experience rather than put them onto um, a receptor and drugs like that is look for, you know, you, we used a thing, the anticholinergic burden calculator, which was a very easy thing to access um, via uh, on, the, on the internet and you could just type in the name of the drug and just see on a score of zero to four what the anticholinergic effect was mm -hmm. and there were quite a few surprises that we 
weren't aware of, but they, they, they came up and stopping, whether it's amitriptyline, clomipramine, whatever, and seeing the effects that somebody does not have Alzheimer's disease, is not demented, just as the family was desperate afterwards, it's, it's hard to express the gratitude. Uh, you know, to, it's hard to you know, just understand the depth of the gratitude that families and patients feel when they discover they're not demented. There are very few things in life which can give people <laughs> such you know, satisfaction. So, yeah, I've had the same experience, Charles. Yeah. Charles, it's professionally, it's incredibly satisfying to <laughs> yeah. relieve somebody of that diagnosis and that burden to, the, to everyone and all of their relations. It's, uh, it's a horrible thing to cause to somebody. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for Tom before we sign off here? Okay, I have, I have a comment um, concerning the, uh, I think he talked about Benadryl. You know, give, I'm just trying to use that as an example, you know, for the anticholinergic effect. I think my, uh, my worry for Benadryl is not even about mm -hmm. the physicians now. I think a lot of patients buy Benadryl right now over the counter to help them sleep. So that, I think that's even the bigger, that's a bigger deal than, uh, than the prescription from the physicians. So I don't know, but I think, uh, I don't know, but there's a general belief out, out there that if you're not sleeping well, you should take Benadryl. So I don't know. I don't know how that can be tackled, but it's a big deal. That's a very good point because um, also, unless one is scrupulous about asking, I, I admit I probably forget more often than I ask, uh, what about the over-the-counter drugs? Mostly because the people I see are on so many prescription drugs, it takes forever to get through that. And then, uh, then I realized, oh God, I forgot all the, I didn't ask about allergies and I forgot to ask about over the counter. And I, I mean, one possible answer at least is encourage people to take less. The, uh, when I realized um, that brand name Gravol Diamond Hydronate, it, it has different names in different countries. Um, has approximately 25 milligrams of diphenhydramine in it. And I realized how sleepy gravel makes people. 50 milligrams of gravel. Wow. Okay, so 25 milligrams of Dynadrol will make people really sleepy. Why not try less? And I, I realized also when I started thinking about it, uh, using uh, an antihistamine like diphenhydramine for an allergic reaction. I, th I think I learned this with intravenous iron. Sometimes people would get, um, begin to get hives, which isn't necessarily an absolute reason to stop the infusion. Somebody who's sufficiently iron deficient, I really wanted to get some iron in them. Well, first let me try some diphenhydramine. If I can suppress the hives, I'll try and get away with putting the iron in. And I started going lower and lower on the dose because with diphenhydramine, say 25 milligrams, uh, come back into the medical daycare to check on the patient and she's asleep, which is okay. It's not the end of the world, but she's a student. She had brought her computer and she was trying to do some work during a three or four hour infusion. Well, next time when you come back for the next dose, why don't I try 12 and a half milligrams or 6.25? Because if it doesn't work to suppress the, the uh, urticaria, I can always put in more with, with intravenous. Now you start thinking about it and realize, well, a, a person who can't sleep could also do that at home. Um, you start with a quarter of a tablet or half a tablet, and if you're still desperately sleepless, you take more. But why would you start with the whole thing? And it, it's very similar if you think of it as um, even as precious, even though they're cheap and expensive, if you think of it as precious, um, you would never, if, you, if you're someone like me who likes your single malt scotch and somebody brings you a really nice bottle, you don't drink the whole thing at once. You take a small part of it and save some for later. But that's, that's a big problem. But, um, you know, what if one is going to use a drug at, or if you can't stop people from being using, using a drug, what, ideally what you would want would be the shortest elimination half-life drug. And it wouldn't be tricyclic. Diphenhydramine, I forget. Mm -hmm. I think the half-life is much shorter. It's maybe between 
four and six hours. Somebody could look it up in a second in the background here, but I presume everybody knows if you want to know that, you just type in diphenhydramine half-life and it'll take you three or four seconds if you're online. Charlie wants us to remind you or Trisha does to fill in the evaluations because you get, you get CPD credit for this, right? For an hour and a half or an hour? It seemed like it was three hours to me, but <laughs> maybe we can wrap it up to three hours. <laughs> Are there any comments or is it time for the, those of us who like our drugs liquid uh, to have our liquid drug or, <laughs> and supper? Yeah, no, Tom, that was wonderful. Thanks. It, it is 7.30, so I think yeah. we should probably uh, respect people's time and wrap up. Charlie, did you have any final comments as our moderator tonight? I wanted to thank everybody for attending and thanking the speakers. You guys did an amazing job and it's truly Great to see the wonderful work that's happening in the South Peace with everybody's support. And as Tom mentioned, the link is in the chat for you to fill out the evaluation and Trisha will also be sending it via email um, to capture it that way as well. So thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us. It's truly appreciated. And have a wonderful night, everyone. Good night. Thanks everyone for joining. Good night. Thank Good night. you.